I didn't meet Aaron through a cause or by getting involved in a project. I went over to a friend's house for dinner. And the friend was sharing a room with Aaron at the time. And uh, the dinner was kind of experimental. <laughs> and uh, my kids were just done by the time dinner was over. So as the grown-ups talked, the kids went in the other room to play. And uh, after a while, they came back in sort of delegation to ask very formally if it was okay if they jumped on the bed. And Aaron said, uh, that's a fantastic idea. And so while me and my friend and my wife sat and talked, Aaron and my kids went and jumped on the bed. <laughs> so uh, at this point, I'd like to make a space for other people to share their ideas, their reminiscences. Thank you. I will be brief. Uh, I'm John Perry Barlow. And Aaron Swartz was the embodiment and apotheosis of everything that I've stood for for the last 25 years. And it is paradoxical that even though that was true, and even though he was profoundly involved with most of my best friends and greatest heroes, I spent almost all the time that I ever spent with him one afternoon in, I think, 1996, when he really was a very little kid. Uh, I had been asked by the headmaster of North Shore Country Day to come and speak to the middle school and the, in, for some reason, there was this 10 or 11-year-old that was in among the middle schoolers. And I spent the afternoon, this was at a time when, I don't know that it, there were that many people who felt the way I did about this stuff. Most of them are in this room now. And I was, I was promoting the idea that we could make a world where anybody, anywhere, could give his thirst for knowledge and his curiosity everything that it wanted to know. And anybody could know as much as any human being knew about anything in the future. And he didn't say much. He was extremely memorable, however. He was much younger. He was all eyes and mind and, and spiritual radiance in a way. And I scarcely saw him again. But years later, last year at one point, I was, I was with a bunch of you know, copyright barons in Paris at the EG8. And they were all talking about how enforcement and education was going to come out right. It was going to be just like the war on some drugs. <laughs> and I happened to be on a panel with these guys. I said, you know, you think you've won this thing or that you will win this thing, but the, the truth is, that you've turned a whole generation into electronic Hezbollah, and you will be dead when they are alive. And I was thinking of Aaron Swartz, and it is really very difficult for me to see that he is dead and they are alive. But he is not dead, and they will be. I've been thinking about Aaron every day since I heard the news. And when I think about Aaron, I remember the conversations that we had about how we wanted to change the world. We sat in the dining room of my co-op over plain white bread. He told me his ideas, and I told him mine. It's been amazing to see the outpouring from all over the world uh, so many people writing about Aaron, so many people inspired by him. Um, Danny wrote, every page I open has his name on it, uh, and it's been like that. And it surprised me how so many people were so moved by him who didn't know him personally, um, or maybe never even heard of him until now. And I think that's a testament to the power of the causes that he stood for and the depth of his commitment to them. Aaron's causes are causes that touch all of us. For a long time, I've admired his intellect, 
in his work. But right now, what I feel most strongly, and, and I think a lot of other people do too, is that I wish I had his conviction. And maybe some of us are asking ourselves, like I've been asking myself for the last little while, what could I do if I had his conviction? Aaron was pragmatic. He wouldn't be satisfied to see us just standing around and talking about him. He would want us to act. So find a way to act. None of us can be Aaron, but each one of us has skills and resources and relationships, strengths that are special to us. Take a minute and think about what capabilities you have, what privileges you have, what you're able to risk, and how you can bring those things to bear on the injustices that surround us. Because when we fight injustice, we're taking care of each other. And we have to take care of each other. We have to take care of each other. Pick something that needs doing. And use this moment when injustice is staring you in the face and use it. Make a promise to yourself to follow through. Because not everyone is able to fight, but we can. Not everyone knows that they have to fight, but we know, and so many more people know now because of Aaron. If you're listening to this, you're not a spectator. You're in this fight with Aaron and with all of us. And there's so much that we have to do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Burton. I worked with, uh, with Aaron Schwartz on RSS 1.0. And we spent literally hundreds of hours on IRC just collaborating and working on projects. And the thing that I always liked about Aaron was that he was really passionate, but he had a great way of just nailing every ethical issue, um, copyright, and just completely taking the right side on everything. And it was just, he's always kind of my hero because there are very few people in the world like that. I mean, in our community, there's maybe 100 of them, and we lost one, and that kind of sucks. The other thing I, I thought I'd bring up was uh, uh, access to open data is really important. Um, open access to scientific data is absolutely paramount for the future of humanity. Uh, I would like you, everyone in the room, to just do a, a little uh, task, if you will. The next time you hear a, a research paper that's mentioned in the news, try to access it. Um, try to uh, read something that the news quotes from a research journal. You won't be able to get access to it. Probably, you probably won't be able to get access to it, and you probably won't be able to get access to it without paying $20 to someone. Um, and for me personally, this hit me recently because I've been dealing with a medical issue. I have a very rare uh, gene snippet and I was only able to, uh, fortunately my doctors haven't been able to help me with it, um, and I was only able to uh, cure myself by searching through thousands of, uh, I literally spent maybe 60 hours reading medical journals. I finally nailed it. it turns out I just needed more broccoli. Um, which is, I know my mom has been telling me that for years. But uh, the only way I was able to get access to these, uh, these journals it was because um, of Reddit, actually. Uh, it was because a friend of mine um, was willing, on Reddit was willing to collaborate with me and get access behind a private firewall, give me the documents, and then I was able to search. And finally, I, I found this uh, paper um, that was written and uh, totally nailed it, and I'm fine. Anyway, I miss you, buddy. Two minutes, 120 seconds. Aaron, Aaron Schwartz. I never met the guy, but he's a huge inspiration after learning all about him in the last week. Um, I'm Robert. I started Organize San Francisco within the Occupy Revolution, and pretty much that was all about sharing information, um, opening up information, and what's going on in the world today. Um, 
And what I, I just want to say, what I want to convey to everyone here is that, yes, we all may be tech literate. We may all have some computer background, but there are a lot of us still in the world that do not. And what I want to open the idea up to everyone here is to think about the people who still don't have no idea of technology or what it is or what it's about. And just think of ways that you can poss possibly create things to help them open up to, to the new things of technology. And... I mean, with the Occupy movement, it's the same thing. It's just a huge gap in technology. And if we open more people up, then it would be a blessing to us all. And I think Aaron would appreciate that as well, as it would contribute to people accessing information, the information they need, the basics of information, the basics of living a basic, wonderful life. And it would be a great opening for everyone, and just it would create a catalyst for everyone as well. So I'm as learning about Aaron and how much of an inspiration he is, I just hope that I can do something as great, as powerful, or just a factor of the man that he was when he was alive. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Sai. Uh, my handle is SaiZai. I didn't know Aaron personally, so I'm not going to presume to speak of him as others have already done so eloquently. However, there are parallels with his life and death that strike fairly close for me, and I'd like to offer a couple resources for those of you who feel similarly. Aaron is not the first hacker to die of suicide recently. Many of us, myself included, struggle with serious depression on a day-to-day -day basis. If you do too, I've put up a page of contacts and resources uh, at sizeye.com slash suicide. Second, Aaron's actions in trying to free JSTOR and PACER are ones that I think many of us would have done in his place as well. I certainly support it wholeheartedly. Previous speakers have talked of the need to reform specific laws, and again, I support everything that they've said. I'd like to add, however, that we also need to open up the power of legislating itself. It is not enough to change a single law when the power to make laws itself is closed to an open community when it's only available to a select few. If you agree, please come talk to me. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Virgil. Uh, I worked with Aaron on some projects until his uh, death, so I'm working on them alone now. Uh, so before, so last I saw Aaron was in October, and he was really sh stressed about the lawsuit. And I was saying, and we all talking to him about seeking asylum uh, in either China or Switzerland, just someplace. And that, by the way, they don't extradite to the U.S. Those are good spots. And um, honestly, I'm kind of upset that he didn't take me up because I was serious. I really was. Um, I mean, I mean, and as much money like USA number one, I presume leaving Switzerland is better than being dead. And um, I mean, he didn't do it. This is his lack of, like, I mean, he was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. Um, and I'm inclined to look at this from a different perspective. So often, like, with AIDS, like, so we have AIDS, like, what kills you isn't the AIDS itself. It's some little side thing, like the flu or something like that. But we still say the AIDS is what killed the person, not the flu. In this case, I think depression's kind of similar. So Aaron suffered from depression, and while in this weakened state, it was a lawsuit that killed him. Um, but in, in the end, it was the depression. And um, I think something we can learn from this is that uh, just, I mean, depression's a serious business. It really is. I mean, if, I mean, a lot of people suffer from this, and they don't get help. And uh, if you don't, I mean, it can be fatal, <laughs> case in point. Um, yeah, um, take care of yourselves. Really, it's important. Hi, my name is Tantak Chalik, 
And I had the privilege of meeting Aaron Swartz in 2001 at the very first W3C uh, technical plenary meeting in Boston. I was, I was amazed by this image of uh, this young boy who was dwarfed by his uh, then brand new titanium PowerBook G4. And was curious, chatted him up, and quickly found a brilliant individual, uh, quite clearly brilliant because he actually understood RDF. Watching him grow over the years was nothing short of remarkable. I, another story I want to share is in 2004, I encouraged him to join the, to contribute to the Technology Developers Contest. And he did. He actually demonstrated how brilliant a hacker he was, and I'll, I'll uh, expand on that later, by building a leaderboard for the politicians that were mentioned the most across the entire blogosphere, across millions of blogs. Not across a few thousand news sites, but across millions of blogs. And this was pretty remarkable, because he combined politics, coding, hacking, and people's voices all in one. And this was 2004. In 2005, I had the privilege of carpooling back from food camp with Aaron, and that must have been the, the, uh, the, the ride seemed like it just took mere moments. The entire time was this intensive, amazing conversation, and I will just never uh, forget, forget that opportunity. Finally, in 2007, one last memory I want to share with you, like on many a warm day in San Francisco, a bunch of us were gathered in Dolores Park. And I recall distinctly ranting to Aaron about some hypotheses about design, usability, user interface, cognitive load, efficiency, all these kinds of things that you know, various geeks think about and talk about. And I remember very distinctly what he said. I said, okay, here are some hypotheses. He said, you should blog that. We would argue a lot. We would argue about metadata, we would argue about a lot of things, and so to hear something from Aaron so clearly where he didn't even, he didn't pick apart any arguments, he said, you should blog that, meant a strong signal to me. Turned out to be one of the more popular blog posts I'd ever made. So I want you to, to go with that message that, you know, if you believe something passionately, uh, you should blog that. Now, I mentioned about being a hacker. Well, a lot of folks spoke about being a hacker. To me, what, that, what, a, what being a hacker means you passionately explore something, someone who gains a deep understanding of it, and then pushes the limits of that knowledge and builds upon it. You know who else does that? Scientists and engineers. And to me, being a hacker is, at the, is the essence of advancing humanity. I want to close with one more statement. And that's that curiosity is not a crime. When I met Aaron, when I was the age that Aaron was when I met him, there was no CFAA. There was no crime for exploring computer networks in such a way. This law is obsolete and should be repealed. Thank you. tall person's microphone. Um, when I was 14, I had the same experience Aaron did. I found the internet and I found peers. When I was 14, I had the same experience Aaron did. I found the internet and I found peers. I'm going to read a short excerpt of something that was important to me at the time. This is our world now, the world of the electron and the switch, the beauty of the bod. We make use of a service already existing without paying for what could be dirt cheap if it wasn't run by profiteering gluttons. And you call us criminals. We explore, and you call us criminals. We seek after knowledge, and you call us criminals. We exist without skin color, without nationality, without religious bias, and you call us criminals. You build atomic bombs. You wage wars. You murder. You cheat. You lie to us. You try to make us believe it's for our own good, and yet we're the criminals. Yes, I'm a criminal. My crime is that of curiosity. My crime is that of judging people by what they say and think, not by what they look like. My crime is that of smarting you, something you'll never forgive me for. 
I'm a hacker, and this is my manifesto. You may stop this individual, but you can't stop us all. After all, we're all alike. When, when I heard about him, I was ashamed. And I wasn't ashamed because I was American, because of what we had done for him or anything like that. I don't really care about being American very much. I was ashamed because I was an internet person and I wasn't brave enough to put JSTOR on the Pirate Bay. A lot of us here, when we were teenagers, the internet's how we met our peers. They weren't at school, they weren't in our neighborhoods. Aaron was one of our brothers and we let him down. Hi, I'm Bess and I'm a librarian. When I became a librarian in 2005, most libraries were providing terrible online access to their collections, at least partly because library data itself was under questionable copyright. Everyone was afraid of being sued and no one wanted to stick their necks out to test the law. Aaron's work with the Internet Archive and the Open Library played a major role in challenging and resolving that legal limbo we were all stuck in. And since that time, there has been a renaissance in the world of free and open source software for libraries. We are revolutionizing library access, and Aaron's work has been a huge part of that. In 2008, Aaron wrote the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto at a retreat in Italy hosted by Eiffel, Electronic Information for Libraries, an international library consortium that advocates for information access in countries with developing and transition economies. In other words, the poor people of the world. At that time, I had just stepped down as co-chair of Eiffel's free and open source software program. I was thrilled that Aaron had joined Eiffel, and although I was sad to step down, I was very happy to leave the cause I cared so much about in Aaron's hands. When Aaron published the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto, the tactics he advocated gave me pause. I thought he was ethically right, but I was unwilling to put my own livelihood on the line with such strong statements. A librarian who issued a manifesto like that would be unemployable, and that's something that should give us all pause. I am ashamed that it took something like Aaron's death to remind me to go back and read my own profession's code of ethics. It reads in part, we librarians significantly influence or control the selection, organization, preservation, and dissemination of information. In a political system grounded in an informed citizenry, we are members of a profession explicitly committed to intellectual freedom and the freedom of access to information. We have a special obligation to ensure the free flow of information and ideas to present and future generations. Thank you, Aaron, for reminding me of my ethical duties. I am heartbroken that we no longer have your voice in this struggle. Thank you for reminding us that we answer to a higher purpose than license agreements. My name is Aaron Greenspan. I've thought about Aaron just about every day since January 11th. And I think I've been trying to figure out why that is. I met him once, exchanged emails like many here. The reason why probably is because I went through some of what he did with the US Attorney's Office about five years ago. And it was horrible. It was so horrible. And just thinking about that and knowing some of what he went through. I was lucky, I got off the hook. I, I told the government about a bug in their system that was my error, apparently. So I'm here today to tell you about that, which maybe I wouldn't have been. But knowing what he went through has made me just angrier and angrier by the day. So when I get angry about things, I like to do things about it. I run a website called Plainsight, which is based directly on Aaron's work with Pacer. It lets you view court cases, it lets you view judges and lawyers and law firms. Pacer has the same kind of bug today that it had in 2008 that Aaron exploited, and that is that you can use $15 per quarter for free. You have to have a credit or debit card, but you can still use the $15 and they won't charge it. So what I'd like to do is put every U.S. attorney's career on plain sight and on recap, which, if you don't know, is actually hosted behind all of us in these various servers, 
um, thanks to the Internet Archive, so thank you, Brewster. Um, but I think it would be fitting to put the USAO online for everyone to see. Maybe they're doing a great job, maybe they're not, but I think it would be great if everybody here could go type in their credit card number on the PACER site and just use that $15 because it's free. It takes five minutes. It's very easy. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Ted Nelson. I like to remember Aaron as he was when I first met him, 14 years old and a full-fledged delegate to whatever conference. He wanted a picture of Doug Engelbart and me, but we insisted on putting him in the middle. And it's such a cute picture, he looks like a happy little gremlin, <clears throat> very, very short at the time. But I hope for most people the agenda is not the destruction of copyright. It's very important to remember, for example, what does the GPL rest on? We wouldn't have Linux if it were not for the iron copyright law and lawyers behind it. My parents lived by copyright, and I think there still ought to be a way that talented, hardworking people whose work is popular can earn enough to buy a house or whatever and live on it. <laughs> I'm very sorry I don't have a chance to discuss this with Aaron anymore. But it's great to see how his spirit lives on. Peace. Uh, my name is Rihanna. The last time I saw Aaron in person was a beautiful day over Labor Day weekend of 2010 in Chicago. We were both happened to be in town, and so we decided to catch up over hot dogs at a hot dog joint called the Wiener's Circle, which is well known in Chicago. You get a hot dog down him. Well, catching up turned into talking for hours. Hours about everything and nothing. Until the sun had set, and we both were terribly late for what other plans we had made for that evening. But it seemed more important to sit there and talk and see what we could come up with and where the conversation would go. And when we finally parted ways, it was dark. And I remember as he walked off his direction, I walked off into mine, this impulse to go back and grab him by the sleeve and say, let's keep talking. Let's see where this goes. Let's see what else we can come up with. But I didn't. And I won't see him on this earth again. The Venerable Bede, who was a medieval monk and scholar and historian at a monastery with a wonderful library, famously compared a human life to a swallow that flies through the dark and then flies through the open window of a monastery or a church and flits briefly through the light inside before winging back out the other way into the darkness once more. Well, a hot dog joint isn't too much like a monastery or a church or a space like this. But the light that Aaron left in this room and in this life is a little bit brighter and a little bit warmer for his having been here. Thanks. It's to my sorrow and shame that I have not been involved much in the free software or movements in the EFF. I've had chances to do things in the world, to work towards helping people who didn't have the kind of resources that I've had, that most of us have had, and I haven't taken all of those opportunities. This is the story of Aaron Schwartz, whom I had never met and never heard of before his death, should be a, was a wake up call to me. And in a sense, it should be a wake up call to some, of, to some of you, to all of us, and to some who are listening and some who won't hear. And you'll have to carry that message to them because they won't seek it out on, for, the, for themselves. We're, we're not good at finding 
the things that we can make a difference on and choosing to make a difference on those things instead of seeking to have fun, seeking to enjoy the moments of our lives. So we need people around us to remind us. The people in your lives who could be making a difference might be people like me who need a wake-up moment to realize that they too can be the difference in the world. Please be the person to remind them. Hi. The Aaron I knew had faith in people. He himself was selfless. And we can't disappoint him. He has been with me in spirit through many of the most important days of my life, even if we were not to, together. When I was first founding a company, he immediately agreed to, to meet with my, me and my co-founder and discuss how he could help. When I was at Hyperink discussing publishing tools, he immediately agreed to work on projects on how we could improve publishing in, in the open source community. He's built many of the tools which are single-handedly responsible for me having a career, including WebPy, and I've strived to create tools like Waltz, which will help other people do the same thing. But I'm standing in front of you right now because I'd like to give something back, because I haven't been as strong as he. I haven't had the genius matched with the will to do something real. Um, currently, I'm working on an initiative called Open Journal, which is an effort to do something like Hacker News for academic journals so that people can collaborate and share uh, academic journals on the web. So if any of you are interested, uh, I'd love your help and support and figure out how we can take the next steps to impact in the future. Thank you. Hi. My name, my name is Asaf Baltov. I'm a soldier in the army described by Karl Malmud um, since before I realized it. In 1992, this is a long time ago, this is before the public internet, a friend came over. I grew up, I, I grew up in Israel, spent most of my life there. A friend came, up, came over with a CD-ROM that contained magic. It had over a thousand text files of public domain works. I didn't know it at the time, but then I read the fine print, and it came from Project Gutenberg. And this is something that I, was, I missed mentioning tonight. Uh, Michael Hart, who we also lost not long ago, who in a, in a, in a big way, of course, uh, was there before most of us. Um, I got this CD-ROM, and for a teenager in Israel, with thirst for ideas, it was amazing. I could read Plato's works in Benjamin Jowett's beautiful Victorian English. I could read, con read Confucius and Voltaire, and I did. And it was amazing, and that experience stayed with me. That richness that was brought to my computer on a CD-ROM that went for two dollars. That stayed with me for a few years, and in 1999, I was asking myself for the umpteenth time, why don't we have a Hebrew Project Gutenberg, damn it? Why can't I find classics of Hebrew literature online? By, by then, of course, we had the internet. And because it was already the umpteenth time, uh, a voice inside me said, well, do something about it. That voice was Aaron's voice. I didn't know that at the time, but I did. I started a Hebrew counterpart to Project Gutenberg. I called it Project Ben Yehuda, named after the reviver of the Hebrew language. And it has been going on since 1999. This is before Wikipedia, um, and has ma been making available public domain Hebrew works to the public at no cost without advertising since then. I've done this with the help of hundreds of volunteers. And somewhere along the line, I figured I need a catalog for this library that I'm building. I didn't know anything about cataloging, but I'm working on the internet. I'm all digital, so it doesn't make sense to use methods that were devised for index cards, like Mark. So I did some research. I studied library technology completely as an amateur over the internet because I could. And I realized that some of the interesting technologies related to libraries these days 
are to do with linked data, with the semantic web. Another way Aaron has touched my life without my realizing it at the time. I got interested in it at some point not too long ago, I think it was 2010, out of sheer uh, nerve, I wrote to the W3C and said I want to join the then new uh, library linked data working group because I run a digital library, I'm a programmer, I'm into linked data, I want to do something about it. And they said, um, sure. Again, inclusion that makes it possible. Also, I, was, I wanted to convert the digital files that I was making into a reasonable, sensible format. I recently picked multi-markdown because it was the only thing that supported all the requirements I had, including having hundreds of footnotes per text. And multi-markdown is an evolution of markdown, which Aaron co-wrote. In all these things, as well as Wikipedia, which used to be my hobby, and now I work for the Wikimedia Foundation, which is another dream come true, in all these things, my path and my work has crossed with Aaron's ideals, passions, and, and, and work. And I'm grateful for that. Fittingly, I am saying goodbye in the Internet Archive where I met Aaron in person last year for the first time. Thank you. At this point, we'd like to close the line to new speakers so that as soon as we're finished with this line, we can all go downstairs for refreshments. Thank you. My name is Phoebe Ayers, and I just wanted to say that in addition to all these other things, Aaron was a great Wikipedian. He wrote um, articles mostly about books and about politicians and every once in a while about TV stars um, in his off moments. Uh, he loved our quirky in-jokes and weird community. Um, along the way, he managed to you know, write one of the seminal pieces of Wikipedia research that had been done. He ran for the Wikimedia Foundation board when he was 20. Uh, but mostly, mostly he liked sharing what he was curious and passionate about in articles. We miss him. Hi, my name's Jake. Um, I never met Aaron, but you know, over the last couple of weeks, I've learned a lot about him. And I think that one thing that's clear to everybody is that he was a um, he, he was a person who had a lot of energy and a lot of love to give, and he uh, really shared himself with a lot of people. And we all wish that um, that things hadn't gone the way they had. And the same thing happened with Ilya. We all wish that somebody could have been there. Uh, somehow, you know, things could have been different, and there m you know, we couldn't. Um, so the question now is, what can we learn from this? And I believe that uh, it's, you know, if you see people with a lot of energy like that, um, you know, you may not realize it, but they have dark times that kind of make up for that. And it's like uh, nobody is a superhuman, but if people seem superhuman at some times, then it means that at other times they don't feel like a human at all. So it's something to think about. And, you know, there's nothing, um, there's nothing wrong with uh, talking to somebody and asking them if, you know, how they're feeling. Uh, when they don't need it, so you just do it more often and um, try and uh, reach out to everybody. Hey, um, I didn't know Aaron very well in person, um, but I did follow him on the internet, on his blogs and everything else uh, for a long time, actually, for, for over probably, it feels like a decade, so I feel like um, I know him. I know him in some sense. So I didn't really have anything prepared, but I, I thought that if I didn't speak here, that uh, I probably wouldn't uh, forgive myself if I didn't speak here. So um, Aaron worked at Demand Progress and and also Avaz too, which are some of my favorite organizations. And uh, I just want to share something that somebody touched upon earlier tonight, uh, just like a little bit um, from from I guess like my country's history of of, of Gandhi. Um, and some of you probably, a lot of you probably very intimate with this. Some of you probably don't know, but. But uh, the British Empire uh, basically 
uh, declared that no Indian could buy salt unless it was taxed through the British government. And, uh, and this uh, left a lot of people uh, uh, without salt. And so Gandhi uh, did, a, did, the, did a, a march to the sea where people uh, went and uh, marched by the thousands and by the tens of thousands and got to the sea and picked up the salt and brought it back to their houses to show that uh, uh, one country or one group of people can't control a resource for the whole world. And, uh, and in the end, Gandhi won. And I really uh, do believe that, that Aaron uh, like is, yeah, was serving the best of, if, if history will look back and, and see Gandhi in, in Aaron. So thanks. There's this thing in astronomy called the Kardashev scale. It's the idea that stage two of a planet's development is where it can harness all of the energy in its solar system. We're not applying the same logic to people. I've met hundreds of kids who could have been Aaron. I didn't know him, but I've met hundreds of ones who could have been him. But the issue is that through a variety of factors, they're silenced. And so we end up with one who takes a gambit and dies. I just wanted to end with a reading of a poem that a friend here in the Bay Area sent me a week ago. It's called When Great Trees Fall by Maya Angelou. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, Small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory, suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die, and their reality, bound to them, takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to unutterable ignorance of cold, dark caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses, restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be. Be and be better, for they existed. Thank you, everybody.